From the Spec Network, this is Fragmented, an Android developer podcast where we talk about building good software and becoming better Android developers. I'm Don Felker. And I'm Kaushik Gopal. Welcome to the show. I'd like to thank Square for sponsoring today's show. We all know Square to be a company that's one of the best stewards of open source in the Android community. But what some of you might not know is that they also have a pretty solid presence in the developer community at large. Just recently, they started a new YouTube channel just for developers at youtube.com slash square dev. And the YouTube channel looks pretty good. They have detailed videos explaining how one would use different SDKs like Python and Ruby to integrate their different products and services. And if you're curious about their different products and services, they basically have a bunch of APIs and SDKs to make taking payments easy. They also have payment forms if you want to quickly embed a checkout experience into a website. And not only that, Square supports iOS, Android, Flutter, and React Native for in-app mobile payments, or if you want to integrate their very famous Square Reader into your own app. Anyway, there's a bunch of stuff in their new developer channel. They are starting to add a lot of these tutorials and a host of other videos too. Check them out at the new channel and that is at youtube.com slash square dev so youtube.com slash s-q-u-a-r-e-d-e-v my thanks again to square for sponsoring today's show gosh here we are again man hey hey it's that time of the year (laughs) it is it's um it's been a few episodes since you and I have uh, been on the mic together. Yeah, and for uh, for folks who don't know, like both you and I have been traveling a lot, uh, mm-hmm. so it has been difficult to lug our gear. As most folks know, we tend to have like an elaborate audio setup, we so do. it's it's hard to like lug around most of that stuff uh, and have like high quality stuff. So what basically we've been doing is we've been recording some of these episodes that you and I have talked about. But we're like, okay, let's just like go quickly record this on the side and have that. Uh, so we still want to have content out for most people. So that's basically what we've been doing so far. Uh, but these sessions are more fun because like it is, you know, we get to like catch up. It is great. I mean, I'm looking here on the site. The looks like the last time we were, act- and this is surprising to me, the last time mm-hmm. we were on a, on a, on a podcast, you know, it was October 14th. Oh, wow. That's yeah, crazy. Right? It's been two months. Yeah, I didn't think it was two months, but yeah, it kind of snuck up on us. So uh, those of you that have been listening um, and hanging in there for us and, and listening to the individual episodes, thank you very much. We've had a lot of feedback from you folks uh, saying that you'd like to hear us both back on shows together. So we're trying to work that in as much as possible and as much as our day-to-day lives will allow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this, yeah, it's obviously, we've been doing this for some time now, so... Uh, there are different things that we want to like we still have a lot of ideas that we want to like use and like we want to take in, in different directions but we can get to that in some time uh, what i wanted to do today don is maybe like catch up with you over how this year has went how you feel about like android development and uh, some of the stuff yeah like anything interesting that came up this year for you and i thought we'll start there yeah, definitely. I think this year's kind of been a big turning point, definitely for me as a as an Android developer. I've been what this is 2019. This marks 10 years that I've been an Android developer. I started early off with the first wow, Android phone. I know, right? Um, That's remember, crazy. You can finally put in your resume 10 years of experience <laughs> with Android. You know, <laughs> which is kind of crazy. It's I remember back in the day when we was first starting out. They'd say like, oh, you have to have five years of Android experience, and it was impossible to find someone with five years of Android experience. But right. They're around now, and so I'm one of them. Um, old gray beard, apparently. <laughs> um, but over the years, you know, that's we've enc- we've had improvements, uh, and then at the same time, it's sometimes it still feels like we're still back where we were ten years ago with certain tooling and um, integration problems here and there. Mm. Um, but overall, I, I think things have improved. Um, I just think the landscape has just definitely changed uh, a lot. Um, but one thing still does remain constant with Android, and I think that's that we have so many options for for what we want to do. Uh, mm. and, that, and what I mean by that is if you juxtapose Android against a, a technology, I'm going to use Rails again because Rails is very opinionated, and you do things the Rails way. Otherwise, Rails will just fight against you. 
And um, Android is the exact opposite of that. Android is kind of like, hey, here's this blank canvas. Um, if you want to use acrylic paint, use acrylic. If you want to use watercolor, use watercolor. If you just mm-hmm. want to just put it all together, you can put it all together. And if you want to use Kotlin and Java, go for it. Um, it kind of just lets you do whatever you want. So you can kind of create your own picture that you want to create with it. And I think that is a little bit daunting to people at times, but now there's a lot of guidance out there from uh, community leaders and, and Google and so forth. Um, so I just think we're at a, at a better place than we were 10 years ago, um, though we just kind of still run into some issues about what's the best thing and what's not the best thing. And, uh, you know, is it testing? Is it not? So still a lot of room to improve, though. Yeah, it's funny you would bring that up. And I've, I mean, there's two things that I want to follow up on that. The first one is I wonder if that's maybe... Because this is definitely a sentiment I've heard from more than just a few people. So I don't think we're the only ones who feel like similar to that, right? Mm -hmm. And I wonder if it's maybe because uh, a lot of the circles that we hang around are people with similar experience. So Mm -hmm. maybe like, you know, folks who've been doing this for some time, like, you know, at least five years have started to see this trend. And so they feel it. And I wonder if it's a cycle because if someone just like entered and like a lot of folks who have just started on Android development two years back, maybe their approach to this is like very different. They're like, oh, I'd love the options and, you know, I'll pick the option that works for me. Um, At this point, for me, it feels like almost like I want to hit a big pause. (laughs) And I know that's like obviously not the way to think about it, but um, the second part of the follow-up that I wanted to bring is it's funny you would say, I actually have this blog post that I've been trying to just like formulate my thoughts around called skinning a cat. Yeah. (laughs) So like there's this there's this idiom that goes there like multiple ways to skin a cat right, uh, and the idea is like there's so many ways to do the to achieve the same exact objective right, and it's you put it exactly like the analogy you used from the software world with Rails versus Android programming I think is great, Rails is very opinionated right, and I wonder if like it is I know I know it is a balance but part of me thinks like with all the different features we have coming in right. Maybe we are like at a transitionary phase, right? Like for Android, mm-hmm. we have like Jetpack Compose. We have like the new motion layout. We have like constraint layout. We have coordinator layout. We have like all these different tools. And all of these are great tools that I feel a lot of really in smart people have put in a lot of time, right? But I wonder at some point, like, you know, is it's, and maybe, I don't know, maybe that is the Android way, right? Like where you have multiple options and you pick the one that works for you, but it just sometimes it becomes taxing, right? Because especially if you work in a large code base and you have like a lot of, if you work with a lot of team members, a lot of them come the different and like like with a variety of experience, which is a good thing. But sometimes like, you know, if you have to do the same thing, there are like five different ways to do it. Yeah, It becomes like just mentally exhausting trying to think about which way to pick, right? Or like if you're okay with like having five different ways, then it almost seems like, you know, it's like this tree that's going to branch out into like a bajillion directions, right? I don't think it's humanly possible to know how to do every single one of these things like correctly. So you have to pick a branch, right? But if it doesn't happen to be the same branch that, you know, another person has chosen to work on a solution, then how do people like wrap their heads around that idea, right? Like it just becomes, it just becomes so crazy. What are your thoughts around that? That's a very good point. I think one of the things I not don't think I know one of the questions that both you and I both get answer uh, asked via the various channels from Fragmented and our mm-hmm. online profiles is, "Hey, uh, what's better? Is it MVVM? Is it is it uh, MVP? Is it MVRX? Mm-hmm. Should I use um, Jetpack Compose? Uh, you know, should I use you know whatever these things are at um, that's coming out, and or should I just kind of just." throw everything in a you know in a fragment or an activity or should I use single screen? And what ends up happening is even for beginners, they run into this analysis paralysis of just like so many options. I don't even know which way to go. Uh, and usually at that point in time, I tell people the best thing to really do is, is to time box yourself and say like, all right, it's going to be choose two or three, you know, look at, look at the ones that make sense to you and say, all right, MVP, MVVM, uh, or just some some vanilla Android, and try to create the same screen a couple of times. See if that works. Give yourself an hour each time, or see how you feel about it, and then just roll with one and see if it works for you. Because even me right now, if you told me, "All right, Don, me and you're going to go create a brand new app for a new company, um, and it's got to be native Android," how would I start it? I can't with a solid foundation tell you how I'd start it. Like I'd be like, mm, "I might want to use MVRX because I kind of like that." but I might want to use 
you know, something different. Maybe I want to use coroutines. Mm-hmm. Mm, but then again, I don't want to waste all that time learning coroutines like in depth because I have so much Rx Java information and knowledge in my head. And so even we run into that situation. And I think it's just like you said, picking one, grabbing it and just running with it and building something useful. Don't worry, you know, don't worry too much about your tech decision. Make sure it's testable mm-hmm. and then just kind of run with it. That's usually my my advice. And then if you realize you're in a couple of days or a week and like, wow, we really messed up the wrong, this is the wrong choice. Okay, what, what can you do? You can go back and start over if you need to. Yeah, that's just like excellent piece of advice. I feel always, you know, the best thing to do is just like try it out, see how it works, like, you know, form an opinion and then, you know, just go from there, you know. Um, here's, the, here's the other thing. I want to throw a wrench in this whole conversation too is – a lot of the apps that we build might not even need to be mobile apps. And yeah, yeah. and that's kind of a, a lot of things that have come down the pipe now of, well, does that even need to be a, a native application? Can that just be a website? Or maybe it's a simple application and then you're having business owners or even developers saying like, well, okay, this would make sense to be a Flutter app or this would make sense to be a React native app. And you, that's a, a slippery slope that you do have to be careful with because of certain components might not be available or what's the future of this company look like or, or something like that. So you do have to be careful of that. But I think those are all valid questions that everyone still wrestles with. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And I wanted to ask, you said you would start a new app. Would you use Dagger? <laughs> no, I would Careful, Don. <laughs> no, I have no, I've no qualms saying that. I would not use Dagger anymore. Um it's funny, we've went back from this original phase of where Dagger came from. Originally, there was RoboJuice. RoboJuice, uh, which I was a, a committer on, was very heavily reflection-based. Uh, there was no code gen. That was a big problem. It had a lot of star, slow startup time. Um, it was pretty much the first dependency, used dependency injection tool out there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we used it at Groupon, uh, where uh, Mike Burton, the original author, created it. And it worked well. Uh, and then from there, I, I know that Square had used it, and then uh, out of Square came came dagger for cogen and, and and speeding things up um but now these days i've run into so many problems with dagger uh compilation rebuild especially on large projects uh that i'm beyond frustrated with it and i would love to remove myself from it as much as possible now disclaimer time there's gonna be a lot of comments from people saying well don if you just use the new reflect thing or you just took time to change the way you did this i don't want to do that like yeah. I just want to write the app. I don't want to have to work myself around a library or anything else. I want to actually build something. And there's different types of developers, people that like to optimize and fix and analyze and and work with developer tools. I appreciate those people with great respect. I'm not one of them. I'm someone who likes to build products, get things into people's hands and and help out lives of people. So no, I wouldn't use Dagger. What about you? Uh, it's, I mean, you know, I've... Uh, I think I was like, I tweeted like just offhand. I was just like frustrated yeah, one night. Did. I, I did. Oh, blew up. You know me well enough to know that that was not a well thought out tweet at all, right? Like this is just me like banging on the keyboard. I was like, oh my God. Well, couch and, and rage tweet. Yeah, that was definitely one of my rage tweets. And obviously that, yeah, yeah, it got picked up. A lot of people like had uh, emotions around it, both <laughs> positive and negative. Mm-hmm. Um, here's the thing, right? Dagger 2 just is it's gotten to a point where you need to learn dagger too you know it's like the same rx java conversation where you like you need to know there are like crazy things like you know there's this multi-binding there's like these annotations called like into set where you can like start to do like crazy sorts of things with dagger and it just goes back to the same thing right i, I was like i just want a dependency injection library man like how hard should it be right well you have components you have sub components you have scopes if you scope it differently something works here if you have you know like if you declare this thing in the parent component then suddenly like the name and there's a mm-hmm. conflict to dagger like, to what? credit uh it is like dude like i it's gotten to a point where with dagger 2 sometimes i'm just like i don't know i'm very lucky cuz i have some really smart folks uh, uh so some folks might remember chris jenkins he happens to work with me at instacart uh the guy is like a wizard at dagger 2 so you know if it, if i spend like 25 minutes or 20 minutes and i'm like i don't know what the hell's going on i'll just like literally you know screenshot the code snippets i'll ask him and he's like oh yeah there's this thing with dagger 2 where you have to do this and i'll I'll go look at the documentation read it i was like what the hell like i didn't know this even existed right and i've been doing android for some time now so it's just like that kind of thing that frustrates me right like i where i feel i need to learn dagger 2 and honestly 
here's the thing though right i i did like dabble with a lot of cuz people ask like oh what about toothpick what about coin what about like a lot of other libraries i have dabbled a little with a lot of them i will say this right cuz eventually if you ask me what i would use i would actually go and back and just use dagger 1 now cuz that one still works right and it was easy sure yeah it was easy sure we man have all the bells and whistles that we get with dagger 2 but that's the point <laughs> you know i was don't want anything the bells wrong with dagger 1 like literally was there like did you ever run into a problem with dagger 1 no i mean like i wouldn't Me either uh, dagger 1 like was simple enough so i wouldn't run into as many problems the, i will say this though like i i do remember like the errors being like really weird where you would yeah, never yeah, understand yeah. but you know i still felt like it was manageable like to the point where i like i i would use dagger 1 and i was like oh yeah okay that like cuz it was simple enough but there wasn't like too much complexity in the setup right now i know what some folks will say right they're like well you can do the same thing with dagger 2 you can just like make it simple and then you, but you know that's not the point it's like the whole rails thing right like when you start to give 20 different options and you incrementally start adding like new features and people different people use different features and sometimes folks may not necessarily understand the implication of like what they're doing like some things you probably are better off not using some features like you mm-hmm. know in quotes that's the problem right like that's where you get into this world where you start to like not understand how to use the tool or you have to learn the tool in itself to be able to do like relatively basic things so anyway that was a very long rant about uh, what my 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 choice is if i was starting a new app today i would totally just use dagger one Yeah. I mean that makes sense. I remember when Dagger 1 came out, I wasn't really confused about how it worked. It was kind of like, "Oh, you just kind of have to build your, you know, your dependencies kind of manually a little bit if you needed them." Mm-hmm. And then that that was kind of it. And then there was some some reflection in there that there was some other problems that people had talked about, but right, that right. was like I think that was in my opinion, and this is probably quite unfounded here if this is a real case. It seems that a lot of people were running into these weird edge cases in these much larger companies. that mm. and a lot of times a lot of apps don't run in these situations and that's i think that's still the case you know and that's this is a, this goes back to the yeah. my feeling about android development in general is that we have completely different like experience levels like we have like the uber facebook level problems and then you have like the regular company problems which are completely different right. you know i might be building an app for a client and i'll for whatever reason I'll make a change to a file in Dagger or whatever's like, "Hey, we need to recompile the entire thing." And you're just like, "Oh my god." <laughs> and you know, everything gets recompiled and I'm there for like 10 minutes rebuilding and then I'll have someone else at a smaller company who has, you know, a couple of modules or whatever and like, "No, we our rebuilds are like 8 seconds." And they're like, "It's completely different project. It's just, you know, different scale altogether." So, I think that's a, a lot of times where you like i might tweet something and people are like i've never had that problem before and it's like i just you just run into different problems when you're at different scales you know what i think i would like i would and i wish someone would come up with like a dagger x or a dagger light where they would use yeah. the innards of dagger 2 but literally replicate the apis of dagger 1 so keep it exactly the same as dagger 1 but mm-hmm. swap the innards with dagger 2 i would use that like in a heartbeat i would just like switch and like use that you know cuz that's all i want i don't want too many features i want the basics and i want it to just like work well and you know that's the best of both worlds it's we always run into this problem right and it's the same thing i have like in general about like the way google is going with a lot of things now a lot of the tools they're adding is great right like every year with io there's like amazing features but it almost seems like incremental levels of improvement in your development life right mm-hmm. like here boom like there's this new tool like you know this whole new thing that like probably like a whole team of people have worked on and as a developer i was like oh that's cool they'll improve my life by about like 5 or 10% right now i will say this they've also come in like i do personally think like with the architecture component stuff like some of the life cycle observers and view model stuff i use that a lot and that's mm-hmm. been like a crazy big change right yeah. like i feel like okay that's a step function now you're changing the game in many ways that was huge yeah but a lot of like this small stuff where, like and honestly like i don't know about you down but like there are some talks that i have like uh in my like watch list from IO19 that I still <laughs> haven't like finished you know because part of me is like I don't know if I'll use this it's cool and maybe I listen to it because it's like oh maybe that's like interesting but there's already like I feel I'm at an overload of like the number of things that I can keep in my head so yes it's all, I, I'm the same way I, there's a watch list later I have an Android watch 
watch <laughs> list and it's full. I mean, there's stuff in there from 2017 and 18 still haven't watched. And <laughs> that's, I can get into a whole other rant about watch lists and, but we'll, we'll save that for another time. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, it's just, there's too much stuff to pick up. And that goes back to the, one of the podcasts I did at an earlier time, which is kind of just like, learn what you need when you learn it. I mean, mm. when you need it. And so sometimes there's no way for you to, to know okay. everything at one point in time. And, uh, you just kind of have to, to go with what you, what you have, because like you said, there's so many things in Android that I can use in the life cycle stuff. I agree with you. Humongous game changer. Mm. But then there's other things like the, I'll, I'll be honest, the navigation components, Mm. Still have still have not touched it. I have no idea. I don't even know right. what it's like. I've mm-hmm. looked at it a few times and been like, okay. But then all the apps that I work on have their own way of navigating. And like to re-architect that to use navigation components would just be a tremendous amount of time for what benefit? You hit the nail there. It's the exact same thing for me, right? I've noticed very few people, like, you know, anecdotally, at least like with the folks that I talk, yeah. very few people have like actually looked at the navigation components the few who've used it and completely you know uh, gone all the way like you know because i know there's like some there's some requirements with the like they use fragments and a lot of like that stuff which i think is fine you know I, i'm not mm-hmm. getting into that at all uh it's it like they seem to like like it and they're like oh that's it's pretty cool it's okay but a large portion of like the folks i've talked to have said well I'm not going to use it now because changing my existing app is going to take me forever. Like, you know, it is, if I have to like refactor my app to use navigation components, it's going to take some time, right? And then it becomes like a trade-off, right? Uh, what is the return on investment? Like the amount of time I put into like change my whole app to use navigation components. Do I have that big a problem with my navigation right now? Mm, not exactly. So then, you know, maybe if I run into like a problem where I was like, oh my God, I really need this because of X, then that makes sense. But Mm -hmm. it's the same thing. You're right. Like navigation components, I've only like looked at like the basic stuff. I've not used it in any like production level app personally. Yeah. And there's so many, this is the same discussion we've had many times. There's so many things in Android. Let's talk about work profiles. I've never used a work pro. I don't even know how to create a work profile. I don't know how that even works. (laughs) Only reason I know it exists is because there's another app I use called Island and I needed to basically have two versions of the same app. I use like a, a budgeting app and there's, I needed two versions of the app to run these two different budgets and I couldn't, I needed to have, you can only install one version at a time and I was like, oh, there's an app named Island and it allows you to install the app two times and what it does, mm-hmm. it creates a work profile and installs the app in your work profile and I'm like, oh, that's genius and I'm like, oh, this work profile thing is kind of cool but I was like, I've never even seen this in Android and I'm just like, <laughs> and then like, yeah. of course, that little, you know, squirrel goes running through your head and you're like, let me go check that out and you're just like, no, 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 I don't even need to go down that road right now. <laughs> I got too many other things to worry about, right. too many other things to focus on. And to bring this full circle, I think that's how a lot of people feel. Like there's these Android Dev Summit, there's, you know, Google I.O., mm-hmm. all these things coming down the pipe and you're just, you look at it and you have to look at the title and the abstract and be like, all right, is that going to help me do my job today? Mm. Uh, is that solving any problem? No. Like Room is one that solved the problem. Like that's good, you know, right. a database solution for Android that's supported. Like that was good, but then there could be something that's obscure that like, okay, that's not too useful. Um, so it's kind of like, which thing is useful? And I kind of wanted to segue this into, you know, one of the things I found very useful over the last decade uh, was the switch from from Java to Kotlin. What is your thoughts? Oh, absolutely. That's, again, that was, you know, game changer. Like mm-hmm. that was one of those things that needed to happen because that was definitely a pain point, Like right? The language was not all that pleasant at least the the language that we had available as android developers was not uh was not very pleasant to work with kotlin changed the game there right like and mm-hmm. there was no there is no question like in my mind i think kotlin was an am- is an amazing uh improvement that was brought in and i think i'm like very happy with the way kotlin is going i will say this though again kotlin has this very similar problem where there's like multiple ways to do certain things. Mm -hmm. And the more and more I see, especially with code reviews, and this is actually what my blog post is like primarily about, uh, you know, that skinning the cat thing. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of hard because some of the things that Kotlin provides is really nice, you know, like some of like the DSL-like stuff that you can achieve is really nice. So it's hard to 
objectively say like, oh, like be opinionated and don't give me that many options. But I, I won't lie. There are times when I look at code reviews and I see people using also, apply, run, and like the different variants. I don't know. Sometimes it just gets to me because I was like, ah, oh, I just wish there was a simple way, right? Like because mm-hmm. there's option A, there's option B, there's option C, there's option D. All of those are like sort of equal. Like, you know, there's no good reason. There's maybe like one slight nuance uh, that's like different. But I'm pretty sure with just two of those operators, you can achieve most of the stuff that you need, right? Why not mm-hmm. just keep two operators and especially at a language level? That's my only complaint with Kotlin, right? At a language level, I don't think it's the same as like how Android gives you different features and APIs, right? I don't want thousand options, you know? Keep it like sort of constrained but make that like a really good choice. And for the most part, I think a lot of those APIs already exist, right, with Kotlin. Like, I can give you the counter example to this. Like, you know, if I'm playing devil's advocate, a lot of the stuff that I, because I had this opinion early on, because when I really started early with Kotlin and I wasn't very familiar, and this is also where like the whole functional sort of like the intersection with functional programming and Kotlin happened. I was like, ah, sometimes an if statement or a for loop is just pretty straightforward, right? Like I should just use this. But the more and more I've gotten comfortable with it, and also I guess Rx has a large part to play with it. Like when you start to chain things, like having like different collection operators, that like is nice, you know? But I don't know, like sometimes I feel like with the also, the apply, the run, like, you know, uh, there's let, let I know in the early days, everyone was using let a lot. And I think let works pretty well. And I know like before folks like, you know, tweet at us or like email us and tell us like, hey, these things are very different. I was like, I get it. I trust me. I really do get it. I use like all of these operators. It's just, I don't know if that was like needed. You know, I don't think we need like a billion of these. And as I work more with like languages like Swift, I see that sometimes they're like pretty opinionated. You don't get more than one way to do certain things. And I kind of like it, you know, just give me one way and I just want to do that and if it like it's a good api it works for most of the things i need let me just like go about my life you know why do for the basic stuff why do i have five options now if you're doing something crazy complex where you're like oh i have this really specific thing where i need to be able to do this then pull out like the big guns or something right uh but at a default level if you give four options we're going to see four different ways of doing the same thing and i don't yeah i know it just gets to me sometimes yeah, I know how you feel. Every time I, I look at those operators, I have to look them up and I'm becoming more and more familiar with them. You know, what's the who, what's the receiver? What's being returned? Is anything mm. being returned? Because um, I use them a lot in, in when I set up test data instead of tests. So completely mm-hmm. understand that. And, you know, to be honest, we're probably going to receive some flack for having that opinion. Uh, I know that episode 176 where I talked about the uh, double bang operator received some <laughs> flack even from, from other community leaders. Uh, about how I felt it was a code smell. That's fine. You don't have to agree with me. Um, it's it's just what I feel is a code smell. Um, so there are things in Kotlin that are that are kind of weird, especially if you start getting into um, like sort of the, the refied stuff and like when you start mm-hmm. building like some DSLs, you can get in there and be like, "Wow, I don't even I, I don't even know what this is saying." Um, <laughs> like you're so far in the machine, but that's the power of Kotlin. You don't have to use that if you don't want to, um, which is great. Um, one of the interesting things that I wanted to bring up in regards to Kotlin is is a question that I get quite mm-hmm. frequently. I don't know about you. It's like, Don, should I be learning Java or should I be learning Kotlin? Mm-hmm. Um, and it's I always tell everyone like, well, look, if you're going to be writing Kotlin, you already need to know Java. Like, you, you're going to have to be reading it at some point. It's still mm-hmm. a JVM language. At some point, you're going to have to say, all right, well, this is Java somewhere. Um, but then it kind of what that does is makes you think about, well, if everything's going Kotlin first, this is the conspiracy theory that comes out sometimes. It's like, well, <laughs> why, why is Kotlin becoming the main language? Well, yes, it's, I think it's better to use. I think it's funner. It's, it's a more enjoyable language to write. But from mm-hmm. a business perspective, why are they using it? You know, and it, it makes me think like, all right, are they distancing themselves from Oracle as far as possible and using a oh, language that they have more control yeah. of so mm-hmm. they don't get any more, you know, Legal you don't trouble. have to deal with the Java programming language problem. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, you know, they don't have to rely on an open source version or whatever. So it's interesting. So who knows where that, what, what that will lead to. Um, I definitely think Kotlin is an improvement. It's where I will continually write um, mm. Android code. And to be honest, if I have to write anything in JVM, even on the server side, I'll still push for Kotlin just because I find it an enjoyable language. You nailed it on the head. 
when you can start chaining various different collection operators together. I know there's new versions of Java, which allow you to do a lot of the similar things. Mm -hmm. um, but then there's a lot of the features in Kotlin that you just don't get in, in new versions of Java. And it just makes coding much more enjoyable. And if it's uh, something I enjoy, then I'll be more apt to do it more often. Yeah, and I, I will say like the Kotlin first thing, uh, I've it, of course, like Google probably has like, there's like some business objectives there. I don't want to get into it because I honestly don't, we don't, like, yeah, that's not something that we are aware of. So it's hard to comment on that. Uh, yeah. I will say this though, like it is possible today to like just only know Kotlin and put out a really good Android app without knowing any Java. You know, I think it's gotten to that point now. Uh, you think so? I think you still have to read Java at some point. I mean, you're going to run into something. You're like, oh, I'm, I'm, how do I do this on Android app? And you end up on Stack Overflow on a Java answer. Oh, I see that way. Oh, that's interesting. Like where like a lot of like the past knowledge or a lot of like there's a wealth of like knowledge in like dealing with some exceptions already that uh, is in Java. So you probably have to like read that anyway. Yeah. Huh. Because you might be saying like, how do I do X, Y, and Z in Android? And boom, you end up on Stack Overflow and there's a, there's a Java answer. You're like, oh, crap, what is that? Like, okay. <laughs> now, and of course, if you paste it into Android Studio and you're in a Kotlin file right. thing, I mean, amazing folks at JetBrains and at Google, like, oh, hey, you're pasting in some Java. Want us to convert this for you? Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, I would, uh, that's a fair point. That's a fair point. I guess like what you're saying is like, if you really dive into like the nuts and bolts and like you're in a production app with like, you know 50 people and like, you, at some point you'll have to drop down and like there will be some java you'll have to run into i think you need to know how to here's a here's a, the, the stipulation you need to know how to read java i'm not saying you have to know oh, how to write it i see okay yeah, yeah oh that's that's a good distinction you're saying like you still need to know how to read java yeah like you tell me to go write a c program <laughs> not happening <laughs> i can read it though <laughs> Like right. I bet, oh, I see what they're doing here. Like, oh, that, okay, oh, mm. that goes over there. Oh, 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 that's tricky. Oh, okay, mm. all right, you know. And then <laughs> I can read it, but you ask me to code the same thing and see, and I'm just gonna laugh at you. So. <laughs> it's all oh, that's like, yeah, that actually that's a that's a very good distinction. Like knowing how to read Java. Oh, I I didn't think of it like that. I because the equivalent for me was like when I was doing a little iOS programming when I was looking at Swift like Swift and Objective C. I do not want to read, like, I do not want to write Objective-C, you know? If that's it, I was like, oh, sorry, guys, like, you know, one yeah. of the other iOS developers will handle this, like, you know, I'm I'm out of here. Because <laughs> I was like, if I'm writing an app, it's going to, like, only be in Swift, because that's the only language that's similar enough to Kotlin that I would want to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, but you are right, like, there's some times where I'm like, oh, what do they do here? And it is in Objective-C, so reading, and I don't know, maybe it's just, like, familiarity, reading Objective-C is a, uh, is it's, it's, it's like crazy town, man. <laughs> you know, yeah, it's, it's, I was like, "What? Wait, what happened? Why are there brackets yeah. there out of like nowhere?" <laughs> you know, why is a weird uh, colon hanging over here? What the <laughs> hell is that thing for? Yeah, and I'm pretty sure most people feel like similarly about Java, but like, uh, yeah, you're right. I think, but still, like knowing how to read Objective C or reading Java would definitely, yeah, is pro yeah, is still needed. I yeah, that's fair. I. Yeah, that's a very good stipulation. But yeah, Kotlin in itself, though, is like I was writing some yesterday and I had to get this list. I had to filter this list. I had to do some manipulation of the data. Then I had to return it as a map of something. And I did it in two and three lines of code. And it was just like, boom, boom, boom. And I thought to myself, I was like, oh my God, this is why I love Kotlin. Yeah. And, and it I just, reads pretty well, too, right? Like, and you're able to do it in a way where like you can go through it and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. It isn't like some contorted sort of like thing that you need to do it's all just like in there yeah and it made sense and I, that's what i stopped actually and I looked at it like you know like you're observing your child who just did something amazing you're just like oh look at that that's beautiful <laughs> <laughs> uh, i like that i like that a funny and, thing uh, you bring about the chain sorry before we go yeah, off no, that go thing i know there are some people who don't like chaining you know they're like oh my god all these chains there's and i don't know maybe that's like Rx Java has just trained us to be okay with chaining and like functional style like programming. But I kind of love the chains, like because mm -hmm. there's some folks who feel like really uneasy and want to abstract, and they're like, "Oh, let's like write a helper function that like sort of like abstracts like four or five parts of the chain." But to me, I was like, I like to see them all down there, right? Like your like, map, flat map, boom, 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 filter this, that. Like I want to read it all because that actually allows me to sort of grasp the concept completely. Yeah, mm -hmm. I feel and, the like, same adding, way. And like trying to like abstract that away so that like, you know, you move it into a function or into a different class. Sort of like, I don't know, to me it's like, obviously I'm not saying like there's, it depends on the code snippet. Like I'm not saying that as a general like 
total statement, but I kind of like having it all just down there. I, I like having multiple chains because as long as the chains are like simple and small and you're not doing like, you don't have like 20 lines inside that like block. Yeah. I kind of like having the chains because it, it almost like helps me keep the continuity in my head, you know? Yeah, and that's one thing I like to do as well is put those chains together. And if I do run into a situation where a block becomes many lines, mm-hmm. what I like to do is I take that block and whatever's in that block, I'll turn into a function or an extension function. And ah, so then I might right. say like, hey, it's dot two view model list or whatever the heck it is, mm-hmm. you know? Okay. And then so I could, and then from there I might map it to something else. But then I can still read all, mm-hmm. I keep all the collection chaining together. So like mm. you, I can actually, I, I feel like I can then see the, the blueprint of the code at that point and say, oh, right, right. I'm getting this something from the API service. Okay, and we're turning it into this and then we're going to map that over there and we're going to turn that into X, Y, and Z. And then we do something over here. Oh, okay. And then we finally get these four values at the end. Oh, oh interesting. Mm. Okay, cool. And then if I need to dive into that big deep block that returns a view model list or list of view models, I can go in there and look at that and see what that does. Yeah. By the way, I love your phrasing, blueprint of the code. I love that. I'm going to use that for sure. Because <laughs> it just like, it so succinctly conveys what I want to see, right? Like I want to see mm-hmm. the blueprint immediately. And then if I care about any piece, then I can go in. Yep. Uh, you just dive right in and say, all right, what is that? Like, I, And it reads well. And that's that kind of goes back to the whole thing that we've talked about is like naming. Naming is important. I know that Hannah Meyer Hansen talks a lot about this. Like you have to, it's important to spend time on naming. Like don't bike mm-hmm. shed over it for weeks, but... It right. can make the biggest difference. I'm going through some legacy code right now that was um, for a client. And I noticed that there's they're following a similar pattern throughout the app um, mm-hmm. with some database code. And inside of all these different database layers, they I what I eventually noticed is they just copied one class and just dumped it into the next one, renamed it. They didn't even rename the variable parameter name. <laughs> And right. so it could be like customer list. And I'm like, why, why are we working with customers inside of the order database? I'm like, what the hell? Mm. And then I'll look, read the code and I'm like, oh, that's just the variable name. They didn't change the variable name. We're actually working with orders. It's just in the wrong name. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> that's got to be confusing. <laughs> well, that goes back. Yeah, it's good naming is important. So if you have, if you're chaining everything together and using extension functions and you're the extension functions are named like hot dog and coffee, and, you know, <laughs> wiener dog or whatever. Like foo bar, you, you know, the yeah. very famous examples we have. Yeah, yeah. yeah let's. I want to riff on that for right now. Yeah, foo bar. Right. I have no problem with foo bar. Like I have none. Like everyone hates on it. We should have better names. Like I don't care about it. It's to me like if I'm using test data and there's a string of a first name, I'll put foo in there, and the last name's bar. Why? Because mm-hmm. it means nothing and I don't care about it. And when I see it, there, my mind does not take a virtual detour on like, who is Bob Smith? Mm-hmm. You know, like, you know, who is, you know, Jenny Chu or whoever? Like, I don't know. But if I see that name, I might think, oh, okay, well, let me do a get annotation. Who typed that? Oh, Kaushik typed that. Does Kaushik know someone named Jenny? <laughs> Was Jenny a programmer? Here? Uh, that, I mean, just think about it. Those are things that go through our heads. And that so is, by, use, huh, that's by using that things true. like foo and bar or weird like just variable names, like you automatically just remove that possibility of, of taking that virtual detour in the code on accident. That's my rant on it. I, 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 I like that, but I want to like follow up on that. So what you are saying though is when naming matters, take, take the time to really name it well. Yes. But when it doesn't, don't do like a partial kind of name, right? Like then if the name doesn't mean anything, if it's literally like a temporary va- variable or something, you're saying put a foo or bar or like a temp one, temp two, just put something where it's immediately obvious like the, the name doesn't matter here. It's just like a placeholder. Yeah. Do you want to hear something crazy? Yeah. I use I for an account variable. Oh, man. Right? Damn. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, no. <laughs> Someone's going rogue here. Okay, okay. People are going to get heated. <laughs> oh, my God. No, I mean, it totally makes sense. Like, it's the Polka. same thing. I've I've noticed in my programming, especially if it's something that's very, like, algorithmic, where it's, you know, it's purely just, like, moving the bits. I, I tend to, like, add names 
that don't necessarily have too much business connotation because it's the same thing, right? When you're going through the code base, I want your focus to be purely on just this snippet. Like don't think about like the other parts of the business because that doesn't matter in this specific code snippet, right? And when it does matter, all I want you to be thinking about is just like the business aspect of it, right? So then I would like name it very detailed. Uh, yeah, if I'm working with a class file, I'm going to name the class something appropriate. If I'm working mm-hmm. with a, ver- if a variable, is representing the first customer and I need to compare it against the second customer, I might call it, you know, first customer or second customer. If I'm querying mm-hmm. something from a, a repository and then in a test and I want to verify data come back, I might call it, you know, found customer because that customer, mm-hmm. I should, I'm expecting that I found them or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it reads, you know, something when I'm using a cert J, expect that the found customer's first name is, you know, is foo. Like, okay, cool. Did that work? So anyway. Right. No, that makes sense. Segwaying a little, because you did mention um, conferences. Kotlin Conf ha- happened recently, and I'm not sure if you've been following the news, but it's been getting a lot of like rave opinions. A lot of folks have been saying that it's an extremely well-run conference with high-quality talks. Uh, have you gotten a chance to like look at Kotlin Conf and like a lot of the stuff that's been happening there? I kind of just took a look at it from a distance it seems like it's a very well organized uh conference mm-hmm. um so i think that's very good um mm-hmm. i haven't watched any of the talks from there from this year i've watched ones from years previous um so i think it's a it's a good conference for for folks to go to um of course very you know heavily catered towards kotlin so if kotlin is your jam and that's your main thing then i think it's definitely something worth looking into what about you what do you think about it well i mean i Again, it's the same thing. I've been hearing rave opinions about it. I I also like yeah. I know JetBrains like they really put on a really good show. Like they know how to like run a good conference. Even though like they've been doing it just it's just like you can see like they ooze quality, right? Like that's part of in their nature. Um, I do wonder though with Kotlin Conf. I wonder if a lot of the excitement now around Kotlin is similar to the excitement we've seen around like a lot of the Android stuff uh, and like from Google's conferences, right? Is that maybe just Kotlin is new enough where there's still an aptitude to like just absorb and learn more. So people are just really interested in uh, this stuff and maybe like five years or like 10 or 15 years from now, you know, it'll like run into the same sort of uh, situation, right? Because Kotlin Conf is very specifically only on Kotlin, right? At least Android, obviously there's a lot of Android stuff involved because Android is probably the biggest consumer at this point of Kotlin, but it is, in theory, a pure Kotlin conference, not an Android conference, right? And I imagine that's probably why there's a lot of like variety and interesting content. So it's just like a random thought. I, I don't honestly know. Uh, the second thing is I actually haven't watched, like, again, it's just that time of the year. So I haven't gotten a chance to see all the talks. Uh, I've just been like casually watching a snippet here or there. I do like, I do want to try and take the time to like watch some of the talks I have queued for Kotlin Conf, but Besides that, I've been getting, and I think you've been getting a lot of these questions a lot as well. People have been doing, going the rounds again and asking us, hey, what do you think about coroutines versus Rx Java? <laughs> you know, and I think we've talked about it before, but I mean, I know, yeah, do you have like thoughts or like anything you want to say for now before we do an in depth conversation on that again? Uh, yeah, just to answer the first question that you had about Kotlin Conf, where do I see it in five or ten years? Is mm-hmm. it going to be, um, is it going to be somewhere the level it is now? I don't think it'll be where it's at now. I think this is definitely a early indication of um, a lot of interest. You know, Android is was still the. I mean, I feel that Android is is the catalyst for Kotlin. Mm-hmm. Um, without that, it's just another open source language that's kind of cool that some people might have gravitated to but let's be honest Kotlin really didn't have the lift off it had until google io and they said hey we're the first class language for android at that point adoption just skyrocketed because you know it had google's blessing um so it's still new and i think a lot of people show up for that and i think it'll be that way for the uh, a number of years five or ten years i think we'll see You'll see it drop, you know, drop off. I mean, do, is there even a, a Java conference? Uh, maybe. I don't <laughs> it know. It probably J- is. Uh, JPL conf. I don't know. Yeah, yeah, it probably is. Yeah. 
I don't know. They talk about four loops or something. I don't know. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> too soon? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That was good. That was good. That's good. Though. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. Uh, I, I think it'll die off a little bit. Um, however, what I think we will see maybe is we'll still see Kotlin heavily talked about in conferences around other languages. Like uh, you might see it at, definitely at an Android conference. There'll be a ton of Kotlin stuff at an Android conference. There'll be a ton of Kotlin stuff probably at backend server, you know, uh, you know, web development mm. conferences where it's all JVM based. Uh, I think Kotlin will be a major player there. And how I look at this is, again, using the Rails example, there is RubyConf. And RubyConf is it's popular, but it's not as popular as RailsConf. And what's the difference? One's a uh. framework, one is a language. And so I think we're going to see the bigger attendance at the framework conference than we do at a language conference in years to come. Mm. That's a good way to put it. Um, now, on the other question, are Arcs Java versus coroutines. Um, this is an interesting one. I think that when new people join, they're going to be join the uh, the industry as an Android developer. They're going to automatically go to coroutines because that just seems to be the natural direction in which they're being pushed at this point in time uh, nothing wrong with that the um people that have been around for a while and have a, an, an apps that have been around for a while that have a lot of um stuff already in rx java again we run into that situation of like all right what benefit does my application and user base gain from going to coroutines do i gain anything you know from an engineering perspective do i speed up at all or am i just staying current um those are both very valid questions, but initially right now it's like, all right, is it worth kind of jumping into? And I think that's a lot of the, the things that people have questions with. If I were to start a new app right now, would I use coroutines? Not sure. What I would probably do is I'd probably spend a couple of days really diving into coroutines deeply to see if it's something that would benefit me. If not, I would just pull in RX Java. What about you? Yeah, I mean, you've, you run it out pretty well, right? It's the same thing. Coroutines is interesting. I only like dabbled very little with it. I think it has legs. It's like definitely, and I think there's also precedent, right? Like a lot of these things, Arik Java has like shown the way that this stuff is interesting. And like as mobile programmers, we find value in such the existence of such a library or tool. So I think that definitely works. You're, you you pin, you hit it right on the, like you you hit the nail right on the head, right? A lot of that is definitely where people are gravitating. You can see a lot of the folks from Google, they're they are definitely pushing the coroutines direction than the RX Java direction. Personally, for me, it's very simple, right? I actually don't with my current understanding of coroutines and with the current stability of the library, like with flows and channels, I don't see a benefit over RX Java. So I'm not going to switch right now uh, because I actually don't see a benefit, right? Like I, the APIs, I don't necessarily like, and maybe this is a comfort thing and uh, over time, maybe that'll change. I don't necessarily know if like, you know, flows and channels like the APIs any better than RX Java mm -mm. Uh, at this point. And that could totally just be a bias because I've been using RX Java for quite some time now. Personally, I don't see a reason to change yet. I am going to wait for like flow and channels like to stabilize. And once that happens, I think, It'll be interesting because, and I think the biggest impetus for me to change will be mostly like outside peers, right? Because Iron Java is also very powerful, right? Like it's to a point where like you don't really need anything else. Uh, but like you said, a lot of new folks are uh, switching to coroutines. And if it gets to a point where I'm in a team and like four out of the five people want to use coroutines and see the benefit, you know what? I'm going to switch. I, that's like that'll be like the impetus that was necessary for me to like switch or change directions. I don't currently see like in an app that already has Rx Java, I don't see the benefit today in just switching to core routines or like changing that up now because there's no benefit, right? Like I, I don't have free time to like just refactor for the sake of refactoring. Like I need a solid reason and I don't see that solid reason today. And maybe the re solid reason for me in the future would be basically that everyone else only knows coroutines and nobody knows Rx Java. I'll, and I'll switch. You know, I'll learn it and I'll switch. But until that happens, I don't know. I just don't see 
the benefit yet. I am very interested in it though, and I will like definitely play around. And I think it's it's cool. It's like one of those things, right? It's like new. It's exciting. I want to learn it. But if you ask me responsibly as a software engineer working to deliver value to you know my stakeholders who pay me money to like write software, I'm not going to switch to anything else because you know it mm-hmm. just wouldn't be responsible on my part personally. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think well, here's the way my feeling around coroutines is. We have two companies that are really pushing Kotlin and coroutines. We have Google mm-hmm. for Android, and then we have JetBrains, which is, of course, writing the tooling and everything. So they're working together and they're really pushing coroutines uh, as a, you know, a nice asynchronous way to do programming. You have flow and stuff like that. Here's the issue that I have with coroutines. I have been to multiple talks on coroutines. I have watched multiple videos on coroutines, and I still cannot understand them easily. Right. So, so it isn't necessarily me, that much easier than yeah. it's not much easier. But here's where if you flip it around, everyone's say, Well, Rx Java is extremely complicated. You're totally right. But let me tell you this, I'm sure everyone's seen this. You've seen the very simple example of I want to do something on the background thread and I apply a scheduler and then I observe on a different scheduler and magic happens. And it's easy. And that's that was the gateway drug into Rx Java. That's what got everybody into Rx Java is how do I get away from async task and have something that can manage my asynchronous task very easily for me? And that was the gateway that got everybody into Rx Java. I personally have not seen that with coroutines. It's like, oh, you need to understand these scopes and these launches and okay, and then these things are going to happen and we're going to show you these thread sleeps and all this other stuff. Like, no, I want you to show me that quick example of like, boom, here's how you can quickly do X, Y, and Z that everyone ends up copying, of course, but gets mm-hmm. you in, is that gateway drug that gets you into using coroutines and all the other nice benefits it might have. Yeah, and I think the subtle difference is, right, there's a nuance, right? Uh, with most stuff, like, I'm trying to, like, pick an equivalent example, right? When I moved to Room, right, or, like, SQL Delight or one of these databases, there was an immediate need. I was like, this benefit I get from switching, I do not get from my existing library. Therefore, I will move, Right. I'm not finding that story yet with coroutines because like you rightly said, right? It's not that coroutines is so much more simpler where I was like, oh my God, this is like, you know, a baby could write this. <laughs> so therefore I should switch away from Rx Java because that is the biggest ding against Rx Java, right? I don't think I've ever seen anyone say, ah, oh, you know what? Rx Java, the, you know, the memory is just like the performance is just so bad. Like n- nobody has told that, right? And mm-hmm. I don't think like performance is even like a conversation anymore there. The biggest thing has always been, well, the learning curve is like really tricky. And and I know like this is a I've seen this argument passed around with most people. They're like, oh, memory leaks is a problem, right? Like there's it's very easy to leak me- it's very easy to leak memory. I personally have not found that as much, maybe because like the tooling has become very strong. So if you're using the right tools, it's you know, it's not necessarily that easy to leak me- unless of course like you're doing something like completely different, right? But for basic usage. I don't feel that much of a problem. So like the only big then hurdle is the learning curve, right? The learning curve is still like tricky for folks to jump on Rx Java. Coroutines, flows, channels, I don't know. I'm not convinced yet if like the learning curve is probably like a little lower, but I don't necessarily think it's that much more easier where we're like, oh my God, this is stupidly easy. We should just switch, mm, right? No. I'm, I'm not finding more. that yet. So no. that's my big problem is, is I, I don't, like you said, you have to have that quick buy-in. And honestly, mm-hmm. if you show me the quick buy-in, you, you show me that quick video of like, hey, here's here's this use case that's going to solve 80% of your problems. Just do this. And you're going to get your background asynchronous stuff and you're golden. Do that. And then you can pretty much handle it. You show me that and I'm, I've probably missed it. It's probably somewhere. But that's the problem that, I ha- that, I, that I've had with coroutine so far. And I'm sure it's out there. Maybe I don't exist. Maybe it's not there yet. And here, and here's the thing, this is an opportunity for someone. And even for mm-hmm. me, I need to go research it, find it and create that example and say, here's, <laughs> here's what you do and then put it out there for people to see. Yeah, it's pretty much the, the <laughs> you know, I had like my whole learn RX Java by example thing. Like that happens to be like, that was my gateway into like, cause I was like, I need this example. I've, with core routines, I haven't yet started it. It is like in my mind, cause I was like, oh, I should like build the equivalent examples because unless you understand something, it's hard to like have a very opinionated, uh, to, at least like I can't like comment too heavily on it because I just don't understand it as well as I do Rx Tower. So there's inherently some bias. 
that being said, I'm with most tools that I want to learn. There's been that, you know, there's been that draw in because I was like, this exists that doesn't exist in the other library. I've not found that yet. So anyway, that's our coroutines are versus our Java sort of uh, argument. And like, we definitely will try to bring someone on who's like definite, who's way more well versed with coroutines. And that's always been pending. I'm just like waiting for some of this to stabilize because, and I think maybe in this time Scotland Conf that happened uh, with flows and channel, like I, I, I want it to be a fair comparison, right? Like I don't want half the argument to end with saying, oh yeah, but that's in the pipeline that's going to come in. Like, you know, oh, it doesn't have that operator yet and like it'll it, it's in the pipeline i wanted to get to a point where i was like you have both options you can definitely use both options let's talk about compares comparisons now you know yeah yeah there's there's tons of options and i think the future will have a lot to hold and we'll get someone on the show to talk to about coroutines a lot more cool cool uh that was fun anything else you wanted to say before we round up this episode no, just a huge thanks to everyone who's listened to us over the years. If you're just joining us, there's a, a huge backlog of, of episodes. And if you're not sure where to start, honestly, just look at the episode list and pick and choose something that interests you. You don't, There's not a sequential order. You don't have to listen to them in order. If you want to learn about testing, you can find the testing ones. If you are looking to get into Android development or just in general, or just kind of, maybe you want to learn about Android Studio, go look at the episodes with Phil Brault where we really dive in deep with the Android Studio tips and tricks. There's something for everybody. So pick and choose. Uh, and thanks for, for joining us on the way. Yeah. Thank you all so much for listening. You have like 184 episodes, if I am getting that number right, to, you know, <laughs> in the backlog. Uh, can you believe it? We've been like doing episodes, like 184 episodes. That's crazy. That's, it is wild. Um, we started out with the the pack to each other of let's do 10. 10, I and remember. see how it goes. <laughs> and then we got to 10 and say, let's do another 10 and i think we did it up to the first 50 we kept like bumping it by 10 and then we're like kind of just at 100 we checked in again and then now we've kind of just started going rolling with the flow yeah. <laughs> it's been a great ride it is it is uh, thank you all so much for listening it, we truly mean that thank you so much for like listening and like giving us ideas and the feedback keep them coming uh if folks want to like comment or like uh give feedback what's a good way to do that Don. The best way to reach me is on Twitter or Instagram, and my handle on both is at Don Felker with two N's. What about you, Kaushik? If they want to find you and talk to you, what's the best way? Uh, Kaushik Gopal, my full name on Twitter, Instagram. I'm available on all those channels. We also have the fragmented cast handle on Twitter. Uh, we definitely look at that as well, so you'll notice us like replying from that as well. So keep the comments and feedback coming. Thank you all so much for listening and we will catch you in the next episode. I want to take a quick moment and thank our sponsor for this show, Square. Head on over to their new YouTube channel just for developers at youtube.com slash square dev. That's the new channel where they talk about integrating a lot of their APIs and services. They also have some pretty cool videos on developer topics in general. I checked out this site and found myself watching their developer video on item potency. It's a pretty cool video, so you should check it out if you're curious about the topic. Anyway, my thanks again to Square for sponsoring today's show. Please do check out their new YouTube channel, and that is at youtube.com slash squaredev. So S-Q-U-A-R-E-D-E-V. Thanks again, Square. That's it for the show, folks. Fragmented is hosted by Don Felker and me, Kaushik Gopal. We edit and produce all the episodes here on Fragmented. Sarah the Amazing Jackson from the Spec Network helps with production assistance and wraps our final mix. Our theme and ad music is by the national recording artist Blueprint from Weightless Recordings. You can find more Fragmented episodes at fragmentedpodcast.com. Thanks for listening, and we will catch you in the next episode.